ipmnation.com. Happy New Year, and I believe our guest has already arrived on the phone, uh, Mike Manetta from the, uh, he's the national chairman of Wolfpack. Mike, are you there? I am here. How are you doing, Matt? Hey, welcome. Uh, very excited to, uh, this is a great way to kick off 2019, so very, very excited to uh, to talk with you. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Absol- Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, happy New Year! And you've been uh, you've been traveling around, of course. So uh, you know, hopefully in the future we can uh, we can have you in here live with us. But I know you're a, you're a busy guy. So why don't you? Um, this will be a good starting point. I have a lot of questions for you, and I'm sure Jenny does too. And and uh, our listeners also can, of course, uh, uh, chime in on uh, the Facebook live feed on the Matt Connerton Unleashed Facebook page. But Mike, can you please um, tell us uh, who you are, a little bit about yourself, and of course, tell us about uh, Wolfpack. Uh, for sure. Um, so I am the, yeah, I'm the national director with Wolfpack. We have really only one goal, and that is to add a, a U.S. constitutional amendment that fixes our elections, that gives us a free and fair election system and just restores some integrity to our elections so that uh, people don't have to raise a billion dollars or millions of dollars just to be able <laughs> to run for office. That was not the intent uh, of the country. We've really lost our way in that sense, and I don't think I don't have to – uh, you know, explain that too much. I think a, most of us get it. You know, our our democracy is um, is no longer dependent on the on the people as it was intended. There's there's way too much special interest pouring into our elections. Uh, oftentimes, dark money um, that we don't even you know we don't even know where it's coming from, and it's really distorted the whole the whole meaning of our of our country. And so uh, we believe it needs to be an amendment to our constitution because. Uh, we don't think anything else is going to solve it uh, for the for the long run. It's the amendment is the only thing that goes above uh, our broken Congress and our in our uh, Supreme Court. So that's what we're doing. And you know, an amendment is also the only thing that can uh, protect state level legislation. There are a lot of groups working on this issue of election reform, campaign finance reform, on the state level, uh, passing state level legislation, but. Uh, it's not going to be able to be protected for the long run without an amendment. So we feel it's really vital that we take steps and and steps uh, using a proven strategy to, to achieve that. So, um, yes, I do travel a lot. I, I hope I can be there in the studio next time. I actually am from New Hampshire. So, oh, no kidding. Uh, you know, adding New Hampshire to, to one of the states that's passing our legislation is really uh, personal to me. So we can we can talk more about that, too, if you want. No doubt, yeah. And uh, also, too, we're joined in the studio by Glenn R.J. Willett, the people's mayor. This is uh, a topic that, uh, Glenn, we're talking with uh, Mike uh, Mineta. He's the um, national director of Wolfpack, you know, nice. trying, to, trying to get uh, money out of politics and, and so forth. Um, I agree with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Huh. Mike, um, can, we, right. can we talk a little bit about um, the solutions? Because you mentioned a constitutional amendment, and I know uh, for me, and I'm sure for probably most people who are are learning about what you're what you're trying to do and what the goal is here um that sounds like a very heavy lift that's that's not something that is easily accomplished obviously it's a a very big hill that you're that you're climbing here um so let let me just and i you know i i kind of know the answer but but for those who are kind of who might be new to the topic why not just i mean can't we just get congress to pass a law that uh, or or maybe a series of laws that'll solve this problem of of uh, you know trying to get money out of politics. So here's the problem with going to Congress for anything. <laughs> um, they, Just one. Uh, they were all elected through this system, right? With a few exceptions, you know, you can point to Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, you know, and a few others who no longer take corporate money. But it's a small handful right now, and so you'd essentially be asking them to pass legislation that would change the system that gave them all this power. Right, right. And, and so so for us, we don't think it's realistic. And honestly, we don't think we have time. You know, part of our bottom line here at Wolfpack is that this is really urgent. You know, too many things are connected to this issue. It's the one issue that, that uh, is connected to every other issue that we really care about, right? So if you're left-leaning, the environment, global warming, you know, scientists are telling us that we're way past the point. We're never going to fix that issue until we get legislators in office that aren't beholden to those companies, those energy yeah. companies. If you're more conservative leaning, we're never going to get anywhere near having a you know real fiscal responsibility 
until we elect people that aren't giving billions of our tax dollars away to, you know, either Wall Street bankers or, uh, you know, companies that don't even pay American taxes and don't even need our subsidies. Right. This system is just not working for either side right now. And so for us, it's urgency. We can't wait on them. And uh, the good news, though, right, is that we do know how to do this. We have amended our Constitution, although it does seem like a difficult mm. and daunting task. We've done it 27 times. Good point. So, <laughs> um, so we feel, yeah. And look, with the Internet and the power of you know, the people now, we can organize around certain issues. Uh, it's totally doable. And, um, and look, here's the thing, I, I guess just to give you, everyone a little bit of background of, of the strategy that we're using. Mm-hmm. So there's two ways, only two ways, as laid out in our Constitution to amend it, uh, as laid out in Article 5. So one is two-thirds of Congress can propose an amendment any day of the week. And in fact, they do. They've proposed, uh, I'm, I'm, let me ask you guys, do you, anyone on the phone know how many amendments Congress has proposed since our founding? I actually have no idea, but I know that there have been many. I know I remember reviewing a few of them and just being horrified by some of the uh, floor floor fights. We, we we should tell we should tell Mike just so he has context where you're coming from. Jenny used to be a state rep here in uh, New Hampshire. Oh yeah. Oh cool. <laughs> you see, I, awesome. Yeah, I know some of them. <laughs> My cousin used to be a state around rep yeah, too. everybody does a turnaround here. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know the lay of the land here, obviously, yeah. that being from here. But uh, no, how, how many, yeah. Mike? Uh, what, what, what is the answer to that? So over 11,000. Wow. No you know, I actually expected only... you to bring a bigger number. Wow. No kidding. I did. Yeah. So they propose, they propose a lot. But look, the system was, the Constitution was designed to work, so they don't make it, right? There's yeah. this really, really high, well, first of all, two-thirds just to make it out of Congress, but then the three-fourths of the ratification. Uh, extremely high to uh, get uh, an amendment ratified. So that's one way. Two-thirds of Congress can propose an amendment uh, or have to approve an amendment for it to go out to the states for ratification. The only other way to do it is you can get two-thirds of the state governments. So right now, 34 would have to apply for a convention, and you can propose an amendment there essentially going around, so going to the state level. From my experience, the state legislators are way more responsive. They would write... A, well, we would write a much better amendment at the state level than Congress could ever write. Um, but little known history, although we've never actually had a uh, convention to propose amendments, uh, the majority of all U.S. constitutional amendments have included a convention campaign. So it's a very effective and proven strategy to pressure Congress to do things that they don't want to do. Um, yeah. Now, that goes all the way back to the Bill of Rights. The Congress was not going to propose those 10 amendments. And so New York and Virginia called for a convention to be able to propose them. And that might not seem like a lot of states, but back then it was actually 25 percent of the state government. And Congress did it. And that has continued throughout our history. Uh, early 1900s, uh, the people wanted to be able to change. Well, they wanted direct election of senators. So they saw our, the way that our U.S. senators were appointed. They used to be appointed by the state legislatures. And it was looked at as very overt corruption. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you're even talking about bags of cash literally going into the state houses back in the late 1800s. No doubt. And so, so the, yeah, so the Senate became what is known as the, or what was known as the Millionaires Club back then. Of course, they're, I think they're both the Millionaires Club at this point. Yes. But back then, it was very <laughs> obvious that the Senate had a problem. So the people used every tool they had to correct it. They did petitions. They did state level legislation. They passed resolutions asking Congress to propose an amendment to fix it. And it was all important, and that's all happening right now. There are lots of groups doing all of those things, but it wasn't quite enough. It wasn't until they came and started passing Article 5 convention calls for that one specific purpose of direct election of senators uh, until they did it. And, th- and they got all the way to just one state shy before Congress did it. So they didn't do it at 10 states asking for that uh, convention for that one reason. They didn't do it at 15 or 20. They, it, it took all the way until Congress finally said, oh, yeah, we're totally in favor of direct election of senators. Right. <laughs> and they did it. Um, yeah. And then, you know, just one more example I'll give you is in the, uh, in the 80s, there was a very big convention uh, push for a balanced budget. And uh, what happened was, again, same thing, actually. Got, we got all the way up to, it was, I think, four states shy. Maybe, maybe it was two. It was like two or four states in that range. And what the, uh, there's been a lot of research done around the convention process, uh, from the Department of Justice, Congressional Research Service. And what these legal reports, uh, point out is that it's very likely that these, that these convention call for a balanced budget led to a lot of 
fiscal responsibility legislation coming out of Congress in the late 80s, which ultimately led to a balanced budget in the 90s under Clinton. But the push from the states for that one purpose uh, played a big role in it. So they do listen. When states start demanding a convention for something, Congress has to pay attention because it's real action, right? If they don't do something by the time we get to 34 on an issue, uh, the, the states get to essentially take that you know, monopoly that Congress has had on proposing amendments and, and start doing it themselves. So uh, those are three examples. So that's what we're doing right now in campaign finance reform. And right now we ha- we've gotten 10 percent of the states to demand a convention specifically for the purpose of campaign finance reform. Oh, OK. Oh, so um, what, do you, what would you imagine that this looks like? You know, if you what is the construct or basic construct of what you want this amendment to look like? Really good question. So I think what my personal amendment would look like is probably not going to be what ultimately would be ratified, right? (laughs) Well, yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, But I'll tell you, you know, just I guess my perspective, I think that we need some sort of system of citizen-funded elections. I think from what I've seen, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, The legislators, um, they use a system like that in Connecticut, talk to a lot of them they seem to like it they don't have to spend so much time raising money uh yeah it's a system where you have to still demonstrate a certain amount of grassroots support so they would have to go out into the community you know get a thousand signatures of course it would be skewed to how big the office is that you're running for you know a thousand signatures and maybe five thousand dollars in small dollar donations to prove that people actually want to support you and that you're that you're taking it seriously and then everyone who hit that threshold would have a certain amount of money because you can't really take money out of politics right um uh, it's always going to be there in some form or another, right. but you have to be able to get your message out there. But everyone would have an, an even playing field uh, to be able to go out there and make your case. So that's just one, like, to me, that would be the direction I would go. But the reason that our resolution is uh, extremely, like, bipartisan, it truly bipartisan, is because we don't dictate what that amendment has to say. First of all, we really don't believe that we would be able to get 34 states to sign on to something that we wrote, right? That's not really democracy, sure, and that's sure. not really the way the system was set up. Yeah. So what we're saying is our resolution language says let's have a convention to address concerns raised by Citizens United and related court cases, because we do want to tie it to you know specific court cases um, and limit it in that, in, that, uh, in that way. But there are good solutions from, from both sides. I mean, look. I don't know how familiar you are with Montana and like their history with campaign finance reform, but they have uh, a really long history of common sense campaign finance laws in Montana. It goes all the way back to the late 1800s. And when Citizens United and some of these other court cases started to happen, it essentially allowed what it, it, it took away these common sense campaign finance laws that they've had for, for 100 years and allowed super PACs uh-huh. and dark money groups to start coming into Montana. And they hated that. Yeah. So they took it all the way to their Supreme Court. And they said, you know what, we're not going to abide by these court rulings. We, uh, we want to keep our laws. And, um, of course, you know, it's just a, a state Supreme Court. So the, the Supreme Court of the United States wouldn't even hear it. They just threw it out. They oh, said, no, you have to abide by our rulings. No kidding. So, um, yeah, so one amendment that's possible that 38 states may agree on. Again, all we're doing is really calling for the conversation. We're like, we have to have a national conversation about campaign finance reform. And and then again, anything that's proposed would still have to have that 38 state ratification, you know, uh, approval afterwards. But we got to have the conversation. And it, one amendment could be simply that the states have the right to regulate their own campaigns. Right? I mean, that would be, yeah. that could be a starting point to this. Yeah, um, yeah. I like that. So that's why we're not dictating it. Um, yeah. John Hopwood is here with us in the studio as well. And John started to say something before, but I didn't have his mic on yet. John, did you have something or a question or something for Mike? He's, well, uh, it's, well uh, Citizens United was 2010. It's not 2019. You say 10% of states. That's five. I mean, yeah, this has been right. going on for a long time. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. But it's a, you know, no, it's a start. It, what start? <laughs> the start is nine years, five states. I think we have a we have a skeptic among us, but that's yeah, okay. <laughs> well, no, that's, that's, I have a question for him. Oh, Glenn has, Glenn has that's a question. That's a fair point. I have a question for you. Um, oh, actually, let, let Mike yeah, respond to John, and then and then Glenn has a question. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Mike. Sure. Yeah, well, first of all, um, Wolfpack did not, has not existed for that long. Uh, we were in response. Wolfpack was started by the host of the uh, Young Turks, if anyone's familiar with that online yep. Oh, network. I'm very familiar with him. Yep. Cenk Uger. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. So he founded it basically when he saw a, a lack of progress on this issue. And it's, it's really been – Citizens United wasn't even the first court case, as we know, right? It goes all the way back to, like, Buckley versus Vallejo. And so this problem has been getting worse for decades, not just, you know, seven or eight years. Um, so he really created Wolfpack. He spent three full years researching, you know, how do we do it? Uh, he didn't want to start Wolfpack. He's too busy as it is. Yeah. <laughs> but he realized that we <laughs> – now, if we're going to solve this, we really do need to be taking this step. The states absolutely need to be demanding this through real action and not just simply asking Congress nicely. So he founded Wolfpack uh, in 2011, but I will say we didn't really get organized until 2013, and then we passed our first state in 2014. Okay. So, uh, And then after that, there was a string of states that started to uh, pass these resolutions, and then we hit uh, a little bit of a roadblock over the last year and a half or so, because there is, unfortunately, uh, some misinformation and propaganda about the convention process that has started to slow us up a little bit. And we can get into those details if you want. Um, but, uh, but we feel like we're going to have a pretty big 2019. And as soon as we can, you know, break, I would say, 10, you could see, you could just see a run of states uh, starting to do this. You got to get that momentum. Yeah. Who, who was the first state, by the way? One more time. Uh, who who was the first state uh, that that you were able to oh, get? Oh, Vermont. Vermont was the very first. Vermont. State. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, Gl- yep. Glenn had a question for you. I think it's a good idea that the states do it on their own for their own state politics. But uh, uh, my major concern is the presidential. That's a, that's totally or congressional. That's totally a federal, especially the presidential race. That's as federal as you as you can get. And so, if you don't do it on a federal level, we're not going to be much better off. Mm. Well, we will statewide if, if the states control it. But if the feds continue to allow it, the presidential race will be as right. bad no, as it is now. Per- mm. Perfectly good point. Yeah, no, so just to clarify, though, we're going through the states, but we're pushing for a U.S. constitutional amendment that would go above Congress and the Supreme Court. That's great. And be the new law of the land. That's what yeah. needs to happen. I agree. You, you know, Mike, too, you, you, you said something earlier about, um, you know, some some people who hold political office actually would prefer um, not to have to uh, spend. I thought I, I thought it was at least 50 percent. And on, on your website, I, I saw a statistic that said 70 percent, 70 percent of their time, you know, trying to raise money for for reelection, because once you get in there, then it's it becomes all about staying in there. And um, I mean, is that is that kind of a tool that you're able to use to appeal to, um, you know, to some of these legislatures, for example, when you're talking to them, you know, to, to try to get them on board with this? You know, hey, look, do you want to spend all your time raising money or do, or do you want a solution? Is that kind of a way to get around, you know, mm-hmm. the whole system protecting itself and not wanting to do anything to regulate itself? Yes, Absolutely. That is a case that we will make. And, you know, there are plenty of people sitting in state legislatures right now that would like to take that next step, you know, yeah. and go into Congress. I know a lot of really good ones, uh, tons of good people at the state level, and uh, they just simply won't run for office because they don't want to have to fundraise so much, you know, and I'm sure Jess can attest to that being in the legislature. <laughs> uh, it scares people. I've talked to people who are legislators that did try to run for Congress, uh, Congress at one point point and ended up having to mortgage their home just to try to stay in the race and make it happen oh yeah and it's just it's a horror story yeah you, know? and you hear them over and over again people that are stuck in congress you know they don't talk a whole lot about it when they're in office but you always see them on like on 60 minutes right yeah. right after they get out of office and <laughs> they're then they still spill the beans and they'll talk talk about how bad it really is right and, right uh it's embarrassing how bad it is. And very often they'll 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 talk about how bad it is as they're on their way to their new job as a lobbyist making even more money. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, right. A whole nother Let me let me play well, we have... Let me play devil's advocate because the, the big screaming elephant in the room is going to be how do you justify taking tax dollars and using them for elections in the face of things like the opioid crisis infrastructure decline? Uh, homelessness, veterans assistance, all of those things that everybody's going to bring up. How do we, how, where's the justification on the tax dollars? Sure. That's a really good question too. And I think it, you describe, and I don't have any, uh, like hard numbers that I can throw at you right now right off the top of my head. Um, but I can, can send you something as a follow up. But the, I think the bottom line is that we spend, we waste too much tax dollars, uh, 
you know, prioritizing on the wrong things. Mm-hmm. So, and the reason well, that we, we all agree there. Yes, for sure. Mm. What's that? We I think agree. we all agree. Yeah. So we are still the most profitable, richest country on earth. We just spend our money in really ridiculous ways that do not benefit the average citizen, right? They benefit, uh, you know, if the defense contractors, mm-hmm. uh, you know, private prisons, yep. and you know, like a, a lot of our money just gets prioritized in the wrong, from the wrong places. So I think that we, and and a, a, aside from just the money, we simply give away in subsidies, right? It's billions and billions of our dollars we give away to corporations that just don't need it. They're, no. the, they're the most profitable corporations that have ever existed. And so it, I, I think that's really the, the bottom line is just reprioritizing. But I'll give you one example. In Connecticut, a state legislator told me this story because I asked that exact same question. Well, how, how did you pay for it? Because that's what everyone wants to know. Right. And he said, well, we paid for it with money that we found in the seat cushions is what a lot of people like to say. And I don't know if this is how it's still funded, um, but he told me that initially when it got going, there was money that people – that the state had in this coffer that when people go to return bottles and cans, they have to – the state has to be able to pay those people back. So there had been this huge coffer that had built up over the years because people just weren't returning them at the rate they anticipated. So there was all this just money sitting there. So they used that money hmm. to, to be able to fund the whole program. So what didn't affect anything, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So there might be creative ways to do it. Yeah. I think, uh, Glenn, did you have another question? You started to yeah, ask uh, something. Hasn't the, uh, the percentage of uh, our congressmen and our elected uh, federal senators in the Senate, haven't the haven't the percentage of millionaires going up? Oh yeah, I believe so. Tremendously, yeah. yeah. And 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 you have yep. to you have to realize that the majority of the voting citizens are not millionaires, so we're really right. not represented. <laughs> right. Well, right. It's, it's like I always say, and I th- I think we'll all agree. You know, when they uh w- when we vote for uh you know to to send these people. To Washington, you know, in, in theory, we're voting for people to represent us, but they really ultimately represent the special interests and the lobbyists and the corporations and, you know, everyone who uh, who pays uh, their bills. And it's and and, you know, and ultimately they they treat it uh, like a business. And I, I think now I mean, I, I the last I knew, I believe Bernie Sanders was the. uh uh, the poorest, uh, quote unquote, member of Congress, or, or and and I think, or at least of the Senate, and I think really, uh, he's been up there for so long. How can yeah. he be poor? Well, he's pretty rich, well, but he's not. Well, he's I don't not a buy billion, that. I don't buy but that. But he's not a billionaire. Maybe a millionaire, but not a billionaire. I don't think he's even a millionaire, but no. I think he's, but I think he's close. Last I knew, but yeah. but the point being, I mean, it's it's like it's it's a business uh, to them. Ultimately, it's not even you know, it's not about representing us. It's not. It's about yeah. the pocket. Right, and that's why they spend so much. You know, that's why they are able to spend so much money for a job that doesn't. Uh, I mean, I don't know how how much the average salary of a senator or a congressman well, is. Congressman but he's paid one hundred eighty five thousand a year, and the Senate, I, I it must be close to the same, and maybe maybe a little more. I don't know. Yeah. Can we just take their salaries and put that into an income? I wish we for, could. You know, you'd yeah. have to have a constitutional <laughs> amendment for that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, there you go. There's your money right well, there. <laughs> well, what, what what would you know, Mike? Because we we talk about getting getting money out of politics, or or however you wanna you wanna put it. I mean, what ideally? I mean, I know we talked about how ultimately what you want isn't exactly what you're going to get with that. But I mean, but ideally, what would that look like if you could if you could have a constitutional amendment that was exactly what you wanted it to be? What would that look like? What would getting out of getting money out of politics yeah, for sure. real look like? Yeah, it would be it would be an amendment that allowed any every one of us on the phone right now to be able to run for Congress without having to mortgage their home. Yeah, it would be it would be some sort of a system because that was the intent, right? We 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 should have people that are school teachers and you know whatever mechanics mm-hmm. running for for Congress and representing <laughs> us because that is the makeup of this country. So you know that would be the goal, right? Of the convention of the national conversation that we're pushing for. The goal would be uh, to have everyday citizens be able to run for office and not just run, but to actually be able to get elected and against all this big money. Mm-hmm. So, uh, look, you know, maybe it's all all elections have to be publicly fund- financed. I mean, that would be the I think a lot of people would say, well, that's the extreme, you know, maybe left position. But again, from what I've seen, Republicans and Democrats alike like the, uh, a system that where they don't have to raise uh, money for a small grassroots you know, um, 
uh, in their in their communities, right? Yeah. Um, but it could be. I don't know if that's realistic. But let me just tell you a story about a Republican senator uh, in Vermont. Actually, when we passed, uh, he said to me when I first talked to him about this. He said, well, I actually agree with Citizens United. I think that corporations should be able to give unlimited amounts of money to my campaign, right? So that's, that was our starting point. Okay. <laughs> um, but this guy, this same guy, ended up being a champion for our resolution because he saw the need for improvement. He said, you know what? I, I think they should be able to give, give money to my campaign, but they should have to exist in my district. So it, should, it could only be companies that live or exist, you know, that have their home base in my, in my district. Because he hated the idea of corporations from out of state, from out of the country, being able to funny, funnel money through super PACs and dark money groups and influence their election. Mm-hmm. So even if we took a step like that, that would be a massive improvement, right? Now, I, think, I do think we need to go further than that because I think uh, at that point you're still going to have you know, too much just dark money interest. And, and uh, it's just not good for our political system just you know, when, for- you, when you have that in there. You have, that's where the dark – that's where the – really negative advertising comes in and that's what turns people off to our political process. Just so, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, just a quick clarification. Could you explain dark money? Because I think a lot of people think they hear that term and all they're thinking is nefarious drugs. They're not (laughs) really (laughs) understanding exactly what it means. Sure. Yeah. So the, the way that dark money, when you hear that term works in this country the most common way is for it to be funneled from a like a C4, C3 organization, a non like a, char- a, a charitable organization, essentially a nonprofit, um, because uh, nonprofits in this country ha- have almost like no disclosure laws. So you could dump as much as you want into them. Mm-hmm. And so what they do is uh, but they also have restrictions on what, you know, what they can and can't do in elections. Um, so what's very common is for uh, a nonprofit to be connected to a super PAC and the money to be transferred from the uh, from the C4 to or the C3 to the super PAC. So then but because super PACs, believe it or not, are actually very transparent. We have to disclose, uh, I think, every donation over two hundred dollars okay. to the FEC. Um, so super PACs are very transparent, but the uh, nonprofits are not. Okay. So that's sort of how the system people rig the system right now. Um, so yeah, and that's pretty that's much it. why and I asked you about much. that because I think a lot of people don't realize that a great deal of this money is actually coming through not so-called nonprofit organizations. Yep, that's exactly where it's coming from. Yep. Yeah, it's almost a, a so, form of uh, money laundering in a way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, legalized money uh, laundering. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about um, what Mike? What was the uh, the Disclose Act? And 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 that I I know Democrats. It was something that the Democrats had introduced, um, in Congress. But I, I is that already? I mean, was that DOA? Is that already uh, fallen by the wayside? The most recent one. Yeah, or the one because there was one. Uh, yeah, there was one about. Five years ago, I believe that didn't pass. Um, if, I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure that that was just pertaining to these past elections. I don't think it was any kind of a standing law. Okay, um, that's what I was told. Okay, um, but, you know. But I know the idea. Our, the idea with that was was transparency. Like they would have to disclose who all their donors w- would be. Correct, and and. Right. And of course, uh, nobody Correct. nobody wants yep. to do that, unfortunately. <laughs> well, you have double sided right. coin there. You have on the one side, especially with nonprofits, some of them people want to have their anonymity, and right. and they have a right to their anonymity. But then there's the argument, of course, that we all have a right to know where the money's coming from. Yeah. So there's two sides to that coin that you have to kind of to deal with. Some of these nonprofits are medical in nature or mental health issues or things of that nature that. We don't want to see money not coming into. So if we enact a law that says everybody has to give up their membership list, that's an issue. That's a big issue. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. Go, right. Which, go ahead, Mike. Well, I was just going to say, which is why it's not really a solution Yeah. on its own. It's just, I mean, again, that puts, I and my, this is just speaking for me personally, 
I think it puts too much on the average voter and the citizen, right? We're already working two or three jobs, right? A lot of us. Yeah. Right. And to ask us to research the donors of every single person running for office and then try to evaluate if those donors are honest or if they have integrity. I mean, that's, that is, it's just not realistic in my opinion. I mean, it's, it's good to have. I mean, it should absolutely be part of our system. If we're going to have a system where there's all this big money and millions and billions of dollars being poured into it, transparency should be a natural part of that. Um, the fact that it's not is, is just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it's not a real solution if we want to get to a government that's going to be representative of, of our values, you know, the average citizen rather than just like the top 1% who can afford lobbyists and sure. be able to dump all this money into campaigns. Sure, sure. Mike, I'm curious, how, how did you get involved in this? And how did you, how did you become the, uh, you know, the, the national chairman for Wolfpack? I'm, I'm especially okay. curious because you're, you're originally sure. a New Hampshire guy. So I'm, I'm curious about, yeah. your, yeah. Team. about your history. <laughs> we, we probably know some yeah. of the, we probably all know some of the same people, in fact. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. How, how did you get here? Uh, sure. Yeah, I was, before I was doing this, I was actually working for the phone company. So I might have, might have spliced some of your wire. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's cool. I was working for, for, for Fairpoint, the splicer. And, uh, it was a great job. I loved it actually. And, but I just, I was always listening to political talk shows like this mm-hmm. and, you know, the Young Turks, obviously. And, you know, I heard Jenk talk about this plan he was working on for years. And then when he started Wolfpack, I just volunteered. You know, I, I signed up to be, you know, the head of Wolfpack New Hampshire and kind of lead the way that way. And then it just sort of evolved into, um, you know, taking on more of a, a national role. And, you know, I, yeah, I think I was a volunteer technically for a year and a half before okay. I got hired. And now I've been doing this for about five years. And, yeah, has totally – it's been a ride. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's wild. upside down. I've, I've – spend most of the year on the road and going to state houses and, and talking to state legislators about this. So It's not often we get to chair but, somebody from the home team, though. Yeah, no, that is cool. Yeah. <laughs> when, and actually, when we met, you told me that uh, you, you work 120 hours a week. I don't know if, if I mean, do you literally work that much? And if so, how are you even uh, alive? It's doable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, wait, it's doable. Um, I'm telling you. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's different, you know. Uh, it's a lot of hours, but it's also something that I'm really passionate about. So yeah. When I was working for the phone company, I, I was actually working for Wolfpack uh, in, on my vacations because I, wow. I really am just, I'm passionate about it. And I just really firmly believe that we have to do this, and I feel this is the right plan. So for me, it doesn't really feel like work, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. The traveling can be a little much for sure. But, uh, yeah, I work with people who actually care about, you know, wanting to fix government. And, and I meet a lot of interesting people at the state legislature, uh, you know, in the state legislatures. Um, so I think just the, the passion for just realizing how urgent this is and, and our need to get it done uh, keeps me going, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But I've been trying to moderate a little more. It's been up to 120, but it's not always <laughs> Did you? I definitely took some time to hang out with my family over the holidays. Oh, good, good. <laughs> uh, I, do, I do try to balance a little bit. Yeah, yeah, good Getting for better you. better at it anyway. Good, good for you. Yeah. Good for you. And did you have any experience prior to that? Like, did you didn't you, did you serve when you were here in New Hampshire, or were you involved? No, in New I did not. No, I did not actually. Um, oh, that's wild. No, I. Wow. And I was terrified the first time I called the state legislator. I was actually <laughs> living in Portsmouth, New Hampshire at the time, and um, and that's one thing I would encourage anybody. You know, one thing I say that we would we do better at Wolfpack than maybe any organization out there is that we teach people how to be citizen activists. Mm-hmm. So, you know, our legislation is important, no question, but there's a lot of other incredible, really good things happening at the state level with regards to legislation. So our, our, you know, our very first goal is just to teach people that it's not hard. You can call your state legislator and get a meeting. You know, Jess, right? You, I mean, in New Hampshire, you, they, oh, yeah. they literally pick up the phone themselves, right? Oh, they'll come um, right up to the state house and just walk up to you and go, hey. Yeah. Yeah. I've done that to yeah, the you governor. Can just walk up there, you can testify. Yeah, people don't realize. Hearings, right? See, that's something I wish we yeah. could duplicate is how New Hampshire functions so we could have that across the country mm-hmm. and, and have that accessibility. Mm-hmm. That's a big problem in the elections is that these people get elected and then they're so far out of reach. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was one of my biggest things that I was always asking my congressional critters and wannabe senators is, you know, are you going to do anything with your constituent services? Because I don't want these, you know, rhetoric letters coming out of your office anymore. I want real attention being paid to the citizens and and what they're saying to you. And, you know, they they all give me the lip service and get elected. And then Mm. 
it never happens. It never changes. Right. And you and I still get form right. letters three months after we tried to contact them, if we're lucky. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, Jess, do you think that they would uh, work for the same amount as New Hampshire legislators do in Congress? Yeah, probably not, right? Probably not. <laughs> I don't think we could get them to do 100 bucks a year. That would be a good thing, though, because then you'd really have people who really want, want to represent the public. They'd be fighting over speaker because you get an extra 25 bucks. Really? Yeah, that's for the whole thing. For two years, full service, $187 and change. Yeah, yeah, it's really a labor of love. Money. It really is volunteer to, work. You to have be. to be a volunteer. Yes. Yeah, our our, uh, our listeners online from other parts of the country, it probably sounds like kind of a shock to them. But, yeah, it really is a citizen legislature here, and it's it's a volunteer gig, basically. Don't you also get tolls? Don't they reimburse you for uh... – You just yeah. don't pay them. <laughs> you don't yeah. pay them. As oh. long as you have your plates on or, like, in your windshield, you, you they wave you through. Right, You just right. go through the cash lane, and they wave you through. Or you can get a – you can actually get one of those um, – those little boxes that yeah. you stick up there. Yeah. Because easy pass. Yeah. yeah, I know what the little boxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, our legislature do pay tax on their $100. They pay no, federal, we don't. They pay federal taxes. It's $187 and change. And no, you don't because you're not an employee of the state. You do not pay. You, they remove it, some tax then, out of it, but you do, don't get it back. It's not really income. Of course, le- legislatures that keep telling me how come we get $100 a year and they tax us on it. So they are being yeah. taxed, at least on the federal level. On the federal yeah. level, yes. Yeah. On the state level, no. We can't control the federal government. We can only control the state. I got a question for you, though. Um, I'm curious to know, if does Wolfpack have a position on the Electoral College? Because that's another hot-button item is the argument between should we be judging our electorates by the general election or should we continue with an Electoral College where we have representation based on the number of citizens? Right. Uh, we don't. No, and, I, and that's, you know, I really believe one of our biggest focuses or our strengths, I should say, at Wolfpack is we do have a very laser focus on what we want to accomplish. Yeah. And that's fixing the election system first, because, yeah, there are lots of things to fix. <laughs> no question. Right. Yeah. Um, good answer. We just feel like, yeah, we, if we if we get, well, allow ourselves to get distracted, um, we, we probably are not going to accomplish the mission because it is it is an uphill battle, you know, to. To fix our election system in the United States, so yeah, um, so no, we don't. Wow, have you? Uh, and uh, one more, and we, we won't belabor you with with uh, you know personal questions. But I, I am curious, Mike, have you considered running for office, or is this? I mean, obviously, this is a long term commitment. What you're doing, but have you have you kind of been bitten by that political bug to actually run in the future? Do you think, or? <laughs> uh, I've, I've considered it. I, not, I'm not really seriously considering it right now i yeah. think that there's a lot more power to be had uh, on the outside yeah no i think with the with the amount of organizing we can do because of the internet these days yeah yeah uh, i'm i'm pretty content just being on the outside and pushing them to do the right thing right right now but yeah but down the road you know not not totally out of the question i suppose i was partly wondering because i know and uh, forgive me her name escapes me is it allison someone you, you had you had someone uh yeah. w- working with you at, at wolfpack who did leave to to run for office, right. if I'm not mistaken, correct? In in California, I think. Yep, that's right. Allison Hartson. She was a code uh, director with me. She's she's got an awesome story. She's uh, she's a force to be reckoned with. I don't know where she's gonna, <laughs> that's gonna awesome. end up doing, but she was a yeah. She was a school teacher in Orange County for ten years, and uh, she stepped down. Uh, she took a pay cut, a huge pay cut. Actually, uh, she it was half her, her salary as as a teacher. Wow. Not as a doctor, right? Oh, wow. Uh, to do to do Wolfpack, and uh, she was the state leader in California, so she led the way. She led like a thousand volunteers in California when we, when we passed there, and uh, she stepped. But she, yeah, so we did Wolfpack together for a long time, and then for well for a couple of years, and then she stepped down last fall to run for U.S. Senate against uh, Feinstein in the primaries. Oh, okay, wow. And that was a a bigger a bigger battle than. Maybe we anticipated that. I don't know if anybody can that. take down that particular monstrosity. I, was, I don't know what to call I it. Know. Yeah. I, I, or her. I shouldn't say it. I should Why, say because her. Because of gun I mean, control? <laughs> she's an you, you, excellent How many things do you want to pile up as wrong with that woman? She's well, been wait, in D.C. for too long. Total. She's been in D.C. for too long. Yeah. Lots of people have been Well, I don't, I don't want to get side, sidetracked by that. I know you're very anti-gun. Lots of elected officials have been in office for too long. Yes. That's the problem. Right, right. Sure. Well, I don't want. Uh, yeah, I don't want to g- get sidetracked with that. But we're better um, off with a Trump. But uh, <laughs> no, we're not. Hey, I got a question. <laughs> no, I got to go over city. city. <laughs> I got to. I got to go city and hall then, right now. But 
looking at your FEC report. You getting arrested again the there, Hoppy? Never, the PAC has never made a single contribution to a federal candidate. Why is that? What do Cor- you do with your money? Correct. Why, why yeah, wouldn't you make, a, why wouldn't you make contributions? Question. That's a great question. Yeah, why wouldn't you make contributions? And, uh, but I got to go. No, I got to find out. I got to go over to the city clerk to look at some stuff. But oh, I got to make an appointment. Bobby's always running around in back. trouble. All right. So, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, so that's it's a really just, uh, great question. What does Wolfpack do with the money that it raises? So we are, we are truly grassroots, uh, almost to a fault, to be honest with you. Um, we, we, all of our funding comes from people paying like 10 to $25 a month. Uh, just as a member, that's mm-hmm. how I, I was the very first member five years ago, paying ten bucks a month. So at one point, Wolfpack was only making ten dollars a month, <laughs> um, and now Big we money. have enough to uh, employ five people. Wow, that's just from people paying. You know, ten dollars, ten dollars a month is like the, what most people pay. Yeah. So uh, we have to be pretty strategic and careful about with where we spend our money. But no, we've never given any money to federal candidates because again, it just comes down to focus. We're going through. The state legislatures, that's where our legislation exists. That's where it's going to exist this year in New Hampshire. Um, so we focus on where it matters at the state level. Yeah. And just this past year, we did. We were really close in Maryland last year. We passed the House. Uh, the, the Speaker of the House ended up becoming a really big ally of ours. And we were in the Senate. We were in a committee. We had the votes to pass. We had enough votes just in co-sponsors to pass the committee. So Maryland should have been on the board, should have been state number six. Um, but there is this fear, which we can get into a little bit if you want. It's it's interesting, I think, about the this fear of like a runaway convention, which uh, has no real standing. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, one of our co-sponsors I them, actually got a call the that. night before from some from some special interest groups, and they scared them off. They said, "Don't don't vote for this." So uh, two of them abstained from the vote, causing us to lose Maryland, and uh, oh. that was pretty devastating to our volunteers. I mean, we we have in each state we have hundreds of volunteers that get involved. We have forty five thousand volunteers across the country um wow that's impressive so we decided yeah so we decided to make a statement in maryland and the one of the senators who voted uh against us in that case uh there was a person from the house who had supported us had voted for us in the house who was running against her and we 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 spent and they had been in a similar race before and it was always within one percent of each other and we decided to get involved. We spent fifty thousand dollars in that race, and each of them only had fifty thousand dollars dollars total, I think. Wow! And we made a. I, I think we made a pretty big dent. And he ended up, the guy we backed, who was uh, one of our supporters, ended up winning by thirty two percent. Oh no! Kidding. Wow! Wow! Comment. That's impressive. Who, who, that and win, that's all grassroots. That win most of the time. And that's the thing I really want to yeah, stress so with this is that everything you guys are doing is at. The community level. It's your neighbor. It's the guy that's coming to get your trash. It's the lady that's teaching your kid. That's what everything you guys are yeah. achieving, both financially and with the work that you're doing, is all at that level. And I think, especially here in New Hampshire, we can appreciate that grassroots effort. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I appreciate that, and I think that's what it's going to take. You know, look. To be totally honest, I think there are there are even you know good intention groups that have been around for a very long time have been unable to solve this problem, you know, part of it might be because uh, they're not truly grassroots. You know, a lot of them have a mm. board, you know, with millionaires who make all their decisions. <laughs> and so, yes, we're coming in. We are not beholden to anybody but the people. And we have a very strong plan. We have a focus. And honestly, I think we're going to do it. I really do. I mean, yeah, we've only gotten five so far, but amending the Constitution is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Right. Yeah. And, and it shouldn't be. It's going you know, um, to take some time. We're going to break through this year. Um, yeah, and it was interesting. I do want to go back to, Mike, what you mentioned about the Article 5 convention, because um, uh, I uh, I used to be a co-host on a show called called uh, Rock, Paper, Hand Grenades, and we had a couple of guys come on debating this. It got pretty acrimonious, actually, between the two of them. It was, um, And they might be people that you know. Uh, one of them mm-hmm. who was uh, pro-Article 5 was uh, Frank Edelblue, who's our current... Um, uh, what is he, uh, Secretary of Education here in New Hampshire? And the uh, other gentleman was Hal, Hal Shirtliff uh, from uh, the uh, John Birch Society. John Birch Society, thank you, who was very, mm. very strongly opposed to uh, any kind of Article 5 convention. And he kind of, and I, you know, I don't, it was a, a lengthy discussion and I don't remember a lot of the talking points, but I, but I do seem to recall 
him using that phrase, you know, runaway convention, Hal, Hal did, you know, because he was arguing very strongly against it and, and articulating his concerns and, and, uh, Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I know both of them. You do? <laughs> I can okay. Yeah. I can remember being spoken uh, to when I was serving in the House when we had a bill about this. And yeah. I can tell you, I'll tell you the truth. I voted to not pass it because I was led to believe that if that passed, our position was going to be to open up the amendments of the Constitution and could thereby remove the Second Amendment. And at the time, I was oh. on the board of directors of the Second Amendment Sisters. I, I hear you on grassroots. I was picking up my kid and on a board call at the same time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. well, you work for me. I worked as an EMT, you know, um, but yeah, we were all. And so anybody that was in favor of self defense was opposed to the bill. I mean, it was basically billed that way. If you vote for this mm-hmm. bill, you're voting to usurp the Second Amendment. Okay. Right. Yep. Well, yeah. It, it, okay. Here's the bottom line, right? And, I, and, I'll give you a few different reasons why that's it's just not not true. But the real the biggest bottom line here, when when you're talking about the Constitution and Article Five and and a convention that would be called under Article Five, is the way that it's worded. It's only a paragraph, so I would encourage anyone if you're curious, all you really have to do is just go and read the Constitution and read Article Five. It is crystal clear that a convention uh, only has the power to propose. Crystal clear. And anything proposed needs to be approved by three quarters of the states afterwards. That's 75 percent of our state government. That cannot be changed. That's that's in stone. It's part of the Constitution. Uh, to change it would require an amendment, which would require 38 <laughs> states agreeing on that, which is just, you know, fairly an absurd thought. Um, but so when, when here's the thing, when people talk about the idea of like a, a runaway convention, mm. what they're implying falsely is that if we get a convention – and all the states send delegates there, right, to this big national conversation, which is it would look a lot like the House of Representatives in New Hampshire, mm-hmm. um, that they could actually change the Constitution right there in the convention, and then they're going to come out, and, and, and that's it. Here's our new Constitution, That's exactly how it's built. That is exactly how right. it's built. I mean, granted, this is a right. lot of years later for me, so give me some credit for growing up and learning. <laughs> but I'm just no, saying, yeah, that's exactly well, how fair. it was sold. Yeah, fear-mongering. Yeah, big time. In, in, in effect, so, yeah. And it's very powerful, no question. And it's, and it's a challenge for us, right? And we're going to get hit and have been hit from both sides. You can get hit from exactly from people who care about, you know, guns and stuff on the on the right and, and, and people on the left who have their own set of issues, right? Because real change, I think, maybe scares people a little bit, right? But um, the, but the thing is, here, here's also important to know, the runaway convention period did not exist until the 1970s late 60s, 70s, mm. when the balanced budget push be, started to, to become a reality. But again, it was progressives that pushed for a convention in the early 1900s, resulting in the change that they actually wanted, right? Mm-hmm. So there was no talk of a run of a convention back then. Everybody was on the same page. Everybody was, all the states were demanding that change, and they got it. They were successful. Um, so this, this is actually quite damaging, this, this idea of a run of a convention, because what it's doing is delegitimizing part of our Constitution, right? It's saying... Yep. If you really step back and think about what it's saying, it's saying, no, we're going to trust Congress to be the only body of government that can propose amendments. Mm -hmm. We're going to strip away the state's rights to be able to propose amendments, even on issues that Congress is not addressing. That is really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, look, they had this conversation at the at the convention in Philadelphia that I don't know if you guys know the whole history, but at the end of the convention, there was only a week left. Congress was going to be the only body of government that was able to propose amendments. And George Mason stood up and he said, hey, hold on here. There's a major flaw in this document. What if Congress becomes the problem? We have to give the people another way to be able to change this document, right? Otherwise, we're stuck. And they agreed. The convention unanimously agreed and said, oh, yeah, you're right. So they, they put in uh, the avenue of going through you know, the convention process. But both of them have the same ratification threshold. That is the bottom line. And uh, – so in the 80s, like I was going to say, uh, started to say, the uh, Common Cause is uh, one of the groups pushing this convention myth, or the, the runaway convention myth, uh, along with the Birch Society. They're sort of strange bedfellows, right, because they're yeah. not on the same side of the political spectrum. Mm-hmm. But they teamed up together on this. And I've been told by legislators, hey, look, uh, it's very hard to come out against a balanced budget. 
right? Who doesn't want fiscal responsibility? Even people on the left who want good social programs still want us to be responsible with our with our money, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's not a good argument to make. So the the runaway commission fear was a very easy one to make. Um, it is, it worked, and I'm, I'm really glad right? you gave so the were, history. They were able to. What's that? I was just saying I'm really glad that you gave the history because I think I'll, that was a turning curve for me is is really researching and reading and understanding it a little bit better to understand of what cool. what it's going to be. And and the thing is too, a lot of people who are on that side of the coin, like I was, is we we look at it and we believe that because we don't fully grasp the idea that it's actually exactly what we want, a representation of the people, by the people, for the people. This is how you get it. And I I was on that bandwagon. I believed it, too, when it was fed to me. Right. And it, I had to learn to kind of undo that. Right. And that's, you know, Jess, I'm, I'm really happy to hear you say that, actually. I mean, but that's encouraging. So that another thing that I say all the time is when we sit down and we can make our case and we explain the history of it and – if anyone wants to really research it, you can go to our website. It's wolf-pac.com forward slash resources is where you would get to the uh, – we have all these legal documents about the convention process. They're fascinating. Um, but it's very encouraging to me when I sit down with a state legislator and they have these same concerns and then they hear the full picture. They're like, oh, yeah, of course, this is something we should be doing. Right? Right. Yeah, let's do it. Um, but it does. It's an education process for us. You know, One of the reasons why I really appreciate you guys having me on here today. Um, but I'll say something else as far as just, you know, with regards to the convention process. Um, it's sort of a fascinating time right now in our history because up until just two years ago, Congress never actually counted these applications, right? So part of the fear that they're putting out is, especially common cause, is they're at 28 states right now. And if there were just six shy, right, you, you'll see they're sending out newsletters. They're, unfortunately, they're raising a lot of money, I have a feeling, on this. Mm. Uh, to stop the, the scary convention because they're only six, six states away from hitting the 34, right? Oh, uh, okay. Um, but here's where they're just, they just don't even bother to do their research because <laughs> Congress officially started counting these uh, two years ago. It was a guy in Hawaii named Dan Marks. Um, he wrote to them and he said, hey, you guys have a constitutional duty to count these. It's in Article 5. How, how have you not counted these for 230 years, right, <laughs> or whatever, 240 years? Yeah. And you know what the House clerk of the United States House of Representatives said, told him? What? He said, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they wrote him back, and he said, oh, wow, we, do, we should be doing this, right? Yeah. So they actually passed a bill. They, they now have a website. If you Google Article 5 Convention Calls, you know, U.S. House, you can, you can see what they've officially counted – and this is a really cool history for us. The very first one they ever counted uh, two years ago was the Wolfpack resolution we passed in Illinois calling for free and fair elections. Oh, no kidding. Oh, so there's no a short kidding. time where we're the only one ever counted. Yeah. Wow. And, I'll be damned. <laughs> but since then, but, but, but here's the point where it matters in regards to the fear of the, you know, we're so close argument. They've now officially counted 78 applications from 38 states. So they're not. We're not six away. We're four over the constitutional requirement, according to Congress, officially right now. Yeah. So, so there. I mean, it, it's just. Look, here's the thing. It's, all these legal reports. The, the, this fear of a runaway convention can only be found in opinion editorials. Yeah. Right? There have actually been really thorough, uh, peer-reviewed reports done by the Department of Justice under Jimmy Carter, under Reagan. Uh, Congressional Research Service has done four reports. The American Bar Association has done like a very thorough report of the convention process. Uh, Harvard Law Review. Um, every single one of the peer-reviewed reports has concluded that the fear of a runaway convention is just not – it's not founded. It's an unfounded theory, and the, oh, the, no. the check on the uh, – because of the 38-state ratification is going to make sure that only the most popular – common sense, reasonable amendments actually make it into the Constitution. Right. So at the end of the day, even if we call, look, there are 28 calls for a balanced budget. That's true. In the 80s, like I was telling you, it got up to about 32. What happened was there was no need for a balanced budget anymore after um, we balanced the budget. So right. the states rescinded them, which they also have the power to do. Okay. Right? So they got all the way back down to 13. Oh, okay. And now they're back up again. So yeah. uh, we're, just, we're just adding to the pile for campaign finance reform. That's it. Right. Where right. are we at now? We're we're at five for our pile. Oh, uh, that's where you're five for about budget. There's thirteen for another movement called Convention of the States. 
which they're calling for a convention for three separate, limited to three topics. Um, the, and, and those are the three main movements right now around the convention process. I have a feeling that once we prove the process can work, and look, I mean, the likely scenario is that if we can get to 25, 30 states on campaign finance reform, Congress will act as they have in the past. But we really hope we get a convention because we think a convention could write a better amendment. I mean, right. let's give someone else an opportunity to propose amendments other than our most, you know, corrupt body of government. <laughs> Correct. Thing, right? Well, um, Athene, you're, you're so, kind of and, up against a, a difficult road in the sense that really where you're coming from with Wolfpack is people to educate people on how the process actually works, whereas the other side can easily send me a flyer or a mailer that says, Oh no, right. if this bill passes, you'll lose your parental rights, you'll lose your marriage rights, you'll lose, yeah. uh, you know, insert your issue here, right, if this passes. And yeah. that's how they get people. I mean, when you're getting mailers like that and people are emailing you going, I got this mailer and this is what it said and don't vote for that, then yeah, it's going to pull at you as a state legislator, whether yeah. you're understanding the topic or not. But people in general need to be educated as to the pros and cons of what doing this would actually do and and why yeah. it's an important issue to maybe change the course of the our country. And, and I don't think that it's bad to say that it's bipartisan, that nobody in America is very happy with our government. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, no, well said. Um, Mike, well, you know, we're, we're uh, getting close to the top of the hour and, and you've been very generous with your time. We appreciate it. Um, but, uh, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that, um, you know, you, you, you let everybody know about, uh, anything, uh, you know, obviously the, the website and, and any other resources people should know about how they can sign up to volunteer if they want to get involved and, and all that kind of stuff. Any, sure. anything that, uh, anything online that uh, we might not have covered that you want people to know about. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. So the web address, you can find everything from the website, everything you need to know, uh, the resources I just mentioned, if you really want to dive into it. Uh, if you like history, the, docu the, the documents are fascinating. The reports that the Department of Justice did and the Congressional Research Service will take you right back to the convention in, in Philadelphia and, and talk about, you know, their, uh, you know, what they had in mind you know, with regards to Article 5. And it's just, it's, it's really interesting reading. Um, but as far as volunteering, yeah, we need it. We are totally volunteer based. Um, you know, with regards to uh, people going into the state houses and, you know, testifying at committee hearings. And that's where our real power comes from. So it's wolf, just like the animal, wolf-pac.com. And, yeah, if you're in New Hampshire, absolutely, we're, we are going to be uh, live in New Hampshire this year. And uh, we're going to need people to come and testify at committee hearings and just really make a big push. Uh, we've, we've already passed the New Hampshire House once, and we passed the Senate once. Uh, just not in the same year. Okay. So we figure that out. <laughs> uh, maybe we, we think this is going to be the year. Um, you you and, have paid uh, attention yeah, to the makeup exciting, here, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, I mean, New Hampshire is just it's its own animal. It's just a, it's a fun state house to to work with. There but, you um, go. <laughs> uh, we That's one way of putting how it. How to get involved? <laughs> yeah, and if, look, if you can if you can become a member, if you don't have time, because look, time is our most precious commodity. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't have time to go to the state house, but if you can just chip in ten bucks a month or whatever you can do, uh, we really are grassroots, and every single person that is willing to do that, we get a little bit more powerful, and we can run you know one or two more elections every year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously become a member, donate, all that really matters for us. Fantastic. Okay. Well, Mike Manetta, uh, from one uh, New Hampshire guy to another, thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, this has been a, a wonderful discussion, and uh, I'll I'll send you links to the you know this will be available online, and I'll I'll, I'll make sure you have all that uh, later. But uh, thank you so much, my friend. It's wonderful to talk to you again. And uh, like I said, uh, we'll have to maybe we'll do this on a regular basis, and you can kind of update us on uh, that'd be great on what's going on. And at some point, we'd That's love good. to we'd love to to see you here in the studio, but. I know you got a lot of lot going on, a lot of traveling and so forth. Yeah. But uh, but keep fighting the good fight. We're with you. And I'd be uh, happy. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Awesome we, getting to talk to you. Thanks to all of you. Yeah. Happy New Year to everyone. Same here. Uh, maybe go and uh, fight corruption this year and get get our government back. Absolutely. Uh, that would be nice. That's my, that's my, that's my wish for this coming <laughs> <laughs> <I'm here. laughs> uh, Sounds all right. sounds good to me. All right. Thanks, Take Mike. Care. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. He's really great. 
All right, that was Mike Mineta, National Director for Wolfpack. Yeah, no, I I like him uh, very much. IPMNation.com.